Good morning, welcome, and thank you for coming out on Satan's least favorite day of the year. It is Resurrection Sunday, and we're thankful for the opportunity of Easter worship. Uh, Christ is victorious over death and sin and the grave, and so we sing Alleluia. Uh, if you are a visitor, thank you for... Praise our risen Lord, uh, but we also want this to be an impactful time for us as he changes our hearts by his resurrection power to be able to follow him. Well, we know that our culture uh, can over-commercialize things. Uh, we're good at that. And uh, before we get too excited about uh, bunnies and eggs and chocolate and spring flowers and nice clothes and all those great things, we want to make sure uh, to keep the main thing in our focus, and we don't want anything to get in the way of or to cheapen the gospel message of Christ's death and burial and resurrection. And so that's why we're here today. And to aid us in that appropriate worship, uh, we want to give some attention at the opening of our service here, intentionally with some extended scripture readings uh, to help us remember Christ's sacrifice uh, Easter can be cheapened if it's divorced from the agony of Calvary, the shame of Christ's trial, the uh, bitter prayer in Gethsemane. And so to help us appreciate Easter, to help us see its significance and impact, we'll begin with some of these scripture readings. Please engage your heart, follow along, uh, and appreciate uh, with some sobriety what the Lord has sacrificed uh, to make all of this possible. Our first scripture reading is from John chapter 18, Christ's betrayal and arrest. The Bible says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book Cedron, where was a garden unto the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake, Of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And the band and the captain and officers and the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Continuing the narrative over in Mark's gospel in chapter 14, we'll be reading some various uh, portions in chapter 14 and 15, starting in verse 53 of chapter 14. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and elders and the scribes. Verse 55, and the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. Verse 60, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. 
And again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and buffet him and to say to him, Prophesy! And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. Chapter 15, verse 1. And straightway in the morning the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. Dropping down to verse 12, Pilate answers them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called the Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put on his own clothes and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one, Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place, Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, upon them what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he cried out so and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. We move into the resurrection account in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, 
he goeth before you into Galilee, and there ye shall see him. Lo, I have told him, told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Why don't we go to before the Lord now in, in private prayer and worship and corporate prayer. And so as I will give you a, a minute or two to pray and thank the Lord for what he has done in taking your sin on the cross and thanking him for the power that he has demonstrated over the grave, over sin, which gives us then the power to become sons of God, to have eternal light, life. Let us pray and thank the Lord for what he has done. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, our human feeble minds cannot comprehend the pain, suffering, the agony, the abandonment that your son went through some 2,000 years ago on that cross. To take the weight of the sins of the whole world for all eternity or for all uh, time is something that we could never fully comprehend. But you did that because you loved us. Wretched, vile sinners though we be, you saw us in our, our sinful state. You pitied us. From the moment Adam and Eve sinned, you had already planned a redemption, the possibility of being restored to a right relationship with Jesus. And this relationship that uh, you sought to restore mankind to, you sought to restore Adam and Eve to. It's one that each one of us can experience. No longer do we have to walk uh, and go throughout life uh, without purpose and alone and scared and unsure of what uh, death brings, what the future brings. We can walk in confidence. We can walk a new life in Christ because Jesus Christ died on the cross, but he didn't stay dead. He arose from the dead. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. And as we have gathered together today, we pray that you would be honored and glorified through our worship. May we never take for granted what you went through uh, to take away my sin and the sins of the world. We ask that every Sunday that we gather and remember your resurrection, that you would be pleased and glorified through our worship today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you join with me as we continue to worship the Lord by singing number 138 in your songbooks, Christ Arose. Would you stand with me as we sing this? The first and third verse choir, you can come up and line up during this song.
be seated. The song that the choir is going to sing now is entitled, Behold the Lamb. Uh, and it just really calls us to praise the Lamb that was slain. And this Lamb was slain for our sin, the sins of the world. And because he is resurrected from the grave now, that is the reason we are gathered together, to worship him. During this song, there will actually be a part where we transition to a song that you're familiar with, Crown Him with Many Crowns, and I will turn around and invite you to sing with me the words on the screen, and then the choir will close out the song at the end. time as we continue to praise the one who lives again. We'll sing uh, number 31 in your wild songbook, the first three verses, just the first three verses. When Christ arose, he turned the tide of human history, by healing out the crushing mold to his heart's
third as the last. When Christ arose, he cried apart, iron grip of sin, and gave us strength of a new beneath his righteous reign. A silent empty tomb proclaims these words for all to hear. Your sinful self is crucified by resurrection. seated. <clears throat> if you have your Bible with you, please turn to the book of Acts. Acts is the account of the history of the church, its beginning and growth. This morning for our scripture time, we're going to consider the radical, personal, spiritual impact of Christ's resurrection power. Acts tells about what happens after what we open the service by reading, Christ's death and burial, his resurrection. And so we want to give our attention to Scripture uh, for the rest of our time this morning. Uh, here at Thompson Road this year, our theme for 2022 is people of the word. And by that, we mean that we as a church family want to come together and grow in our increased intake of God's Word, our appreciation for it, our understanding of it, our obedience to God's Word, the Bible. We want to be people of the Word. Everyone in our culture is seeking a meaning, a mentor, a motto, a mantra, and we just want to live by God's Word, the Bible. If that sounds old-fashioned to some, it's because of a confusion between that which is dated and that which is durable. If it sounds out of touch, it's because uh, people fail to distinguish between that which is merely cherished tradition and that which is timeless truth. Uh, either God spoke and inspired the writing of Scripture, or He didn't. And if He did, we want to live by it. We uh, want to know what it says and structure our lives around it and trust our eternity to its instruction and promise. The Bible is not dated, it's durable, it's not just cherished tradition, it is timeless truth. And we don't just take that by blind faith or simply because uh, those who've gone before us have accepted it as true. There are many proofs for the reliability of Scripture, uh, things like scientific insight, historical accuracy, often confirmed by archaeology, um, the theological cohesiveness of a book written over hundreds of years by dozens of authors in different locations speaking a few different languages and uh, some of those writers having little or no access to each other's writings and yet the Bible is unified in the picture it presents of God of man's condition and of redemption. Probably the greatest empirical evidence of the reliability of Scripture is fulfilled prophecies. The Bible is full of them. History affirms them. A major problem for the skeptic to explain. Here in Acts chapter 1, if you look at verse 3, Luke writes uh, these words, to whom also he, that is Jesus, showed himself alive after his passion, that refers to his suffering and death, by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Luke is a historic historian. It's interesting. He, he's the writer of the book of Acts, and at the opening of his gospel account and the opening lines of the gospel of Luke, you can uh, actually read about some of his methodology and his research as he uh, gets eyewitness accounts and so forth. And that's one of the things he mentions here in verse 3 as infallible proofs. One is uh, the testimony of eyewitnesses. When we talk about the resurrection, there's, uh, there are, are hundreds who saw Jesus. We have a record uh, from a few of those eyewitnesses, several of them. Uh, there's proofs like the failure of the Jewish and Roman leaders to be able to produce Christ's body if he had not indeed resurrected. But among these 
empirical arguments that we could make to support the reliability of Scripture and the authenticity of the, the resurrection account. In my opinion, the greatest argument for the reliability of Scripture and the, the accuracy of Christ's resurrection is actually this personal spiritual impact. Uh, consider the dramatic change for people like the disciples who after Jesus' death were hiding in fear, but after witnessing his resurrection were boldly proclaiming his message. Or skeptical people like James, the half-brother of Christ, who during Christ's life and, and death uh, rejected Christ's claim as Messiah and, and his identity as Son of God, his message of salvation, but after seeing him resurrected, he became uh, one of great use in spreading the truth of the gospel message, or Saul, who we know as Paul, one who violently persecuted those who followed Christ. When he saw the resurrected Christ, it had a radical, personal, spiritual impact in his life. In the same way, uh, those of us here today, which is probably most of us who uh, have accepted the Bible as true, have placed our faith in Jesus Christ as resurrected, we have experienced that impact on our lives that the Bible has had, that Christ has had. As we read our Bibles, we find that the Bible answers our questions, that it diagnoses our heart problems, that it soothes our hurts and corrects our errors, that it motivates our growth, that the Bible informs our faith, and that it enriches our understanding of and our relationship with the God whom it claims as its author. I believe the Bible's true because I've read it and submitted to it and found it to be a living message of God. I believe that Jesus is resurrected because of my personal relationship with him. I've experienced his eternal comfort and strength and guidance and conviction and sanctifying influence in my life. Now, you could fairly say, well, that you know, works for you or it works for others. It doesn't mean it's absolutely true and it doesn't mean it will work for me, because what we're talking about, really by definition, is anecdotal evidence. Well, personal testimony says, here, it worked for me. But anecdotal evidence becomes stronger the more you realize uh, that it's not just one person's experience, but most here would say, that is my experience too. I have found the Bible to be God's living word. I have found Christ to be my living Savior. And not just here in this place, but across our city, across our state, across our country, and around the world today, uh, like-minded believers are gathered to celebrate these truths and to joyfully affirm them. Uh, a lot of people believing something doesn't make it true. But there comes a point where the impact in many people's lives, when it's radical enough, when it's genuine enough, if it's observable enough, becomes an undeniable evidence that there is something to these claims of the biblical reliability and of the resurrection power, and it's worthy of our attention. Have you ever heard the saying, the proof is in the pudding? The proof is in the pudding. I don't know if you've heard that or used that or ever really thought much about what you're saying uh, when you use that phrase. That is actually a phrase that goes back, people have been saying that for 700 years so it originates uh, over in Britain, uh, and it originally was the proof of the pudding is in the eating, is the full uh, statement that has, has kind of uh, been condensed a little bit over the centuries. Uh, but well, you know that some things over in Britain, they use the same words to mean different things sometimes. So when we talk about pudding, I think of you know the chocolate, vanilla, butterscotch, sweet dessert that uh, they actually would call custard. And so for Britain, a pudding, at least back in the 14th century, uh, refers to actually a savory dish that is meat-based. The most popular meat in the puddings was, was sausage. And so I don't know what it quite looks like or what it might taste like, uh, but if you think, okay, 14th century meat pudding, uh, and you kind of couple that with the problem of uh, limited refrigeration access, uh, you could see how that might go bad uh, in a very literal way. And so the saying became, uh, the proof of the pudding, whether or not it's good, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You find out by taking a bite. 
Uh, you find out by taking a bite. The proof is in the pudding. In fact, uh, you, you know, you've maybe heard the word botulism, refers to the, uh, the uh, spoilage of meat and the impact that can have. It actually is from the Latin word botulus, which is the Latin word for sausage. So, uh, you know, some words we carry over straight from the Latin. I'm glad we didn't just do that, you know. You have botulus and eggs for breakfast or you, know, you order a pepperoni and botulism pizza, you know, hope, gladly we got, I, I love sausage, so I'm thankful that we've distanced ourselves in that way and thankful for refrigeration and all of these things. Um, I'll stick with the chocolate and butterscotch when it comes to pudding, but if there was a sausage pudding, I think, you know, even if it hasn't gone bad, it's not going to taste good, but if, you know, if you taste it and it's spoiled, you're going to know the proof is in the pudding. Now, if you take a bite of sausage pudding and it tastes good, you can know for sure that thing is not spoiled. Because, uh, you know, even if it's not spoiled, it might not taste good. If it tastes good, you know for sure that that thing is good. The proof is in the pudding. Well, in our lives as believers, uh, or in your life if you're considering this faith, the proof is in the experience of it. You cannot know completely, 100% certainty by empirical evidence alone uh, without experiencing it before you can make your judgment. It's not that we can sample Christianity and see if we like it or not, but did you know there's a verse in the Bible that says, taste and you'll see that the Lord is good. And the proof is in the pudding when it comes to Christ's body, the church, in so much that you can talk to people who have experienced Christ and they will say that it is good. There's no one who has been genuinely saved who would say, well, that was a bad decision. Regret that. Wish I hadn't done that. And if you can imagine yourself around an enormous banquet table and people are passing around this meat pudding and person after person is saying, this is good. This is great. This is the best thing I've ever had. This will change your life. Well, the more you see of that, the more likely that you ought to try this out and it might make a believer out of you. We're in the opening pages of Acts, and chapter 1 continues in verse 8 with Christ commissioning the 11 disciples. The second half of the chapter, they pick a 12th to replace Judas, and they go out as apostles to spread Christ's resurrection message locally and then globally. In chapter 2, we read of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the, the, the beginning of the church, the New Testament church. Thousands of people experience Christ's resurrection power through radical personal spiritual impact. In fact, uh, the end of verse 41 there in chapter 2 tells us they gladly received his word and were baptized and there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The end of verse 47 says the Lord was adding to them daily such as should be saved. This dramatic, radical, personal, spiritual impact response was a response to the Easter message, the original Easter sermon, the resurrection power of Christ. If you look, it just is, this is a summary of, of Peter's sermon. If you look at chapter 2 and verse 22, Acts 2, 22 says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Verse 32 says, this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. The message of Christ's resurrection power was impacting lives there in enormous volumes. And in chapter 3, Luke will turn to give a significant chunk of Scripture to talk about a radical personal impact upon just one man, a man who's not named. All we know about him is that this is a man above 40 years old. He is disabled, unable to walk, and is a beggar. And as he is stationed each day begging at a gate called the Beautiful Gate. 
Peter and John come and notice him, and he notices them, and he hopes to receive something from them. And verse 6 of chapter 3 says, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. It's significant in verse 6 what Peter says to the man. What is the power that heals this man? Because in verse 12, Peter wants to make sure that the crowd knows, hey, don't look at us like we've done anything special. Don't be impressed by us as if we by our own power had done this thing. In verse 6, he clearly says, by the, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up, rise up and walk. Now, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, everyone in that region knew, had been executed not long ago. If Jesus is dead, how can his power heal a lame man? And so this man's being made whole, his ability to walk and leap and praise God. He's been changed on the outside as well as on the inside as he praises God with his voice. That radical, personal impact was a direct result of Christ's resurrection power. Jesus, who had been crucified, was still healing, was still changing lives. Well, this is what the religious leaders are going to have to grapple with those who in the Jewish system wanted to cling to the old covenant of the Mosaic law, rejected Christ as as Messiah, had him executed, wanted just to go back to business as usual. But there were so many people accepting the resurrection message preached by Peter and his companions that they have to do something about this. And the healing of this lame man witnessed by so many is something that causes such a stir that in chapter 4, the religious leaders take action. They Verse 1 of chapter 4, spake unto the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them as the apostles were speaking. Verse 2, this is the religious leader's reaction. They were grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They don't like the Easter message. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was 5,000. About 5,000. So many people being saved. The religious leaders are so grieved, they lay hands on them. They put them in a holding cell. The next day, they bring them into the center of this large area where they can judge their case and figure out what to do with these men. And verse 7 says, when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power... Or by what name have ye done this? It's unclear whether they're asking about the healing or the preaching or the the life change that so many were professing. They want to know where the power is coming from. It can't be Jesus because he's been executed. So where is this power coming from? What name? Verse 8, Peter, for his response, was filled with the Holy Ghost and said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day... Be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. There is a man who was killed but he's still impacting lives, not by his legacy, not by his memory, not by the teaching he left behind, but by the living power of one who was dead and is again alive. Verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What name are you doing this in? It's in Jesus' name, and no other name would work. No, uh, other names might be used for parlor tricks and even demonic activity, but only one can radically, personally, spiritually impact someone's life with resurrection power to make that which is crippled whole, to make that which is blind see, to make that which is spiritually dead come alive. 
Verse 13 says, when the religious leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. They had all kind of arguments and all kinds of defenses prepared to level against Peter and John to say, this is why we're the religious leaders and you're not, you need to submit to us and here's how we can argue for the old covenant and what they would just not call the old covenant, the current Mosaic covenant that, that they could keep the law, that they would continue to, to uh, offer sacrifices, rejecting Christ's sacrifice. And, and they had arguments ready for everything except this verse 14, this man standing there that everyone knew for the last 40 years had been unable to walk sitting by the beautiful gate as they came and went every day. For that, they had no answer. Verse 16, they said, what shall we do with these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Here was their conundrum. If Jesus is dead, then he can't be Messiah, and he can't be God, and they could move on with their lives. But if he's dead, how is his power still healing people? How can a dead man produce radical, personal, spiritual, and even physical impact on someone's life? This is what they had to deal with. And today, we have to be able to answer that same question. If Jesus is dead, how do you explain his impact on so many lives that continues from day to day to day to day, 2,000 years later? And if he's alive, that means he has power over death. Why would you want to follow anyone else? To whom else would you entrust the keeping of your soul? Who else's directions would you take for the afterlife? And the one who is there, than the one who after life continues to live, after death has risen again. So here's the question that these religious leaders had to grapple with. The common people grappled with it and came to Christ in the thousands. Can you grapple with this today? Here's the question. Do you believe in the radical, personal, spiritual impact of Christ's resurrection power? Do you believe in that? Do you embrace that message on an experiential level? If your answer that, to that is, well, no, maybe I've got objections, I've got questions, I'm not quite ready, or maybe you're confused, you're not quite sure, well, I don't, I, I, I believe the Bible, but I'm not sure that I have personally experienced that radical, spiritual, life-changing power of Christ's resurrection. Well, as you look around today, there's no one perfect here, no one close, but there are a lot of people who would love to tell you, hey, I might not have experienced a miraculous physical healing, but I was spiritually blind till Christ, through God's word, helped me see. I was spiritually lame until uh, Christ's resurrection power helped me to walk with him. I was spiritually impoverished until Christ in the Riches of his grace gave me the wealth of forgiveness and uh, adoption into the family of God. People who were spiritually dead now have spiritual life because of the resurrected Christ and his impact upon us. See, the thing with Jesus' resurrection isn't just, well, he, it turns out he's God, he's immortal, so even though he was killed in the body, he was able to resurrect by power and live forever because he's God and that helps him but doesn't necessarily do anything for us. No, his resurrection power is something that he uses to impact our lives, the lives of mortal people, the lives of sinful people, the resurrected Christ, immortal and divine, takes his resurrection power and offers to radically, personally, spiritually impact your life through it. He told his friends in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's Christ's resurrection power being offered to you through belief, through embracing the gospel message. The Bible is true. 
the resurrection of Christ is real. Jesus is alive. If you've never been radically, personally, spiritually impacted by his resurrection power, would you respond to his message today in the way thousands did then and people continue to do now? Well, how do I respond? How do I embrace this message? What do I do if I'm not sure about it? What if what I do if I say, well, I, I believe in Jesus and all of that, but I'm not sure I've been radically, personally, spiritually impacted. I'm not 100% sure that all of my sins are forgiven and if I were to die today, as Jesus said, though I was dead, yet would I live? How can I know that for sure? Well, Peter gave it right in his message. If you're still open in Acts chapter 3, as people came, they saw the man healed. They knew this Jesus who had been executed was still impacting lives. What could be going on? How could we share in this resurrection experience so that our spiritually dead souls could be resurrected and we could be brought into relationship with God through Christ? How does it happen? The answer is in verse 19 of chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Peter addressing the people filled with the Holy Ghost, gives the gospel message and says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. This is the radical personal spiritual impact that you can experience. You can have your sins blotted out. Have you ever had your sins blotted out, all of your sins, past, present, and future? Do you know that you have? The way there, verse 19, is through repentance and conversion or a turning around, a turning to God. What we need to understand from this passage, and if you're struggling with, you know, do I have this or do I believe this? Um, or uh, maybe I'm already okay, I'm not 100% sure. You need to understand this morning that Christianity is not something that you've always had. There's no such thing as being born Christian. You can't be raised Christian. We might hear that lingo thrown around, but you, you, can't, you can't be raised with radical personal spiritual impact. You, you, you can't inherit it. You can't be Christian because grandma was or because dad was. You can be raised in a denomination with maybe like an inherited denominational affiliation or something like that, but radical personal spiritual impact can't be inherited, and it can't be your default status that you've just always had. Neither can Christianity be, be something that you gradually absorb. Maybe you're kind of like, well, I, I know I'm not perfect. I haven't done a whole lot of really bad things, but I've just kind of always believed that God is there. I try to pray. I try to be a decent person, and I feel like that, that God is there for me, and so hopefully I'm okay. Friends, there's nothing uncertain or vague or wishy-washy about radical personal spiritual impact of Christ's resurrection power. You have it or you don't. You're spiritually alive or you are, as the Bible says, as we're born into this world in our default condition of being estranged from God, spiritually dead because of our sin. Well, it's not something you've always had. Christianity isn't something you gradually absorb. Rather, from Peter's perspective, from a biblical perspective, Christianity is something to which you must spiritually convert. And when I say Christianity, you know that word is almost lost its meaning in some ways because it's been misused and abused and appropriated in so many different ways in our current culture and back through history. When I say Christianity, I'm talking about the life of following Jesus Christ, the life that has been radically, personally, spiritually transformed through Christ's resurrection power. That is Christianity, to be a Christ one, a Christ person, a Christ follower, one through whom the resurrected Christ lives. That Christianity, which is the only hope for our eternal souls, can only be brought about through spiritual conversion. And so Peter's message is, repent and be converted. Turn around, turn to God through Christ. 
In Luke 13, 5, Jesus said, unless you repent, you will perish. In John chapter 3, he said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't gradually absorb that. You didn't physically get born into that. There has to be a moment in time where you are converted, where you turn, where God changes you spiritually, personally, in an impactful way. Jesus said, I'm the door. Jesus said, I'm the way. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. Peter says in chapter 3 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. Chapter 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. Jesus is the only way. And it's not just by some mental ascent to thinking he's there. There has to be conversion. Have you ever repented? Have you ever been converted? Have you had your sins blotted out? Have you experienced the radical personal, spiritual impact of Christ's resurrection power. Salvation is not about what you've done or who you are or what you're trying to do or hope to do. Salvation and repentance are about who Christ is and what he has done. So repentance isn't a good deed you do to clean up your life so that you can be saved. Repentance is to stop doing, to say, I can't live for myself anymore. I can't try to get Christ's righteousness on my own anymore. I can't try to get to God by my deeds anymore. I have to stop and just rely on what Jesus has done and trust his resurrection power to make me God's child. Let me ask the question again, because I think probably most people here would, would say, I... I know my sins are blotted out. I've repented. I can remember the time when I was converted, when I, by God's grace I turned to him through Christ. Let me ask the question one more time. Hey, if you, when we ask this question, do you believe in the radical, personal, spiritual impact that comes through the work of the resurrected Christ? If your answer to that question is yes, yes, preacher, got you covered. Go ahead and wrap up. Let me ask one follow-up question. That's very important. A point of reminder to direct us today on this Resurrection Sunday. Is radical, personal, spiritual impact observable in your life? If you say, yes, I have that. Yes, I'm saved. Yes, I've been converted. Yes, I've repented. Yes, my sins are blotted out. Yes, I'm on my way to heaven. Could you stand next to Peter and John like the healed man did and confound the doubters and skeptics because the change in your life is so radical, so apparent, so observable that the skeptics are silenced? Is resurrection power observable in your life? Has the resurrection power that, in which you claim to believe has it had such a personal spiritual impact that those who interact with you can observe it, can see, observe its undeniable evidence. His resurrection power, if you're saved, extends to us. It's not that we can turn on this thing where suddenly we're, hey, we're such wonderful people that people will, all around us will say, wow, what a wonderful person that is. No, but the, the good news of resurrection power for the believer who's embraced Christ is that as you go through day after day and as you face your trials and as you face your struggles and as you battle against sin and as you find yourself failing and doing wrong and not living up to Christ's standard, that Christ's power helps to raise you again, that that living, vibrant life of Christ can pulsate through you, can bring healing, can bring cleansing, can bring sanctifying, can bring growth, so that as he rose from the grave, you can rise above those struggles that would bring you down spiritually, that would cause you to sin, and so that your life can be different from everyone around you, because Christ's resurrection power flowing through you doesn't take all your problems away but it changes your response to them. It changes your attitude through them, your demeanor, your countenance, your attitude, so that people around you can say, you know, maybe I've had my doubts about the Bible account. Maybe I've had my skepticism about Christ's resurrection and all of that, but there is something in this person's life that I just have a hard time explaining that maybe there is an undeniable, radical, personal, spiritual impact of Christ's resurrection power. 
You know, there's a saying, another food saying, please don't think too much about that sausage pudding. Um, back in the 14th century. I don't know if that's why Columbus and the Pilgrims left, maybe, but I, I'm thankful I'll stick with the butterscotch. But um, there's another food saying, you never trust a skinny cook. You heard that? Never trust a skinny cook. Well, Sarah, my wife, is an exception to that. Skinny girl, great cook, and maybe you probably know other exceptions. But here's the thing. If uh, someone uh, has something that's really worth having, it ought to show in those who have it, right? It ought to be observable in those who have experienced it. Hey, if your food is really good, cook, you better look like someone who knows how to enjoy good food. But if your Christ is really raised Christian, then you better look like someone who's had their life impacted by grace. Is it observable in your life? If you, I would have to answer that question honestly with a no. I'm kind of like the people next to me. I don't rise above spiritual problems, and I'm not that grieved over sin, and I'm not seeing, you know, Christ's resurrection power give victory and spiritual struggles in my life. I wouldn't say there's a radical impact. Well, maybe you ought to ask the question, have I truly been converted? Is Christ in me? Am I in him? Radical impact is not something that you add to your life, that you say, yes, I'll, I'll choose that as my religion. That's a compartment now of my heart and attention and resource. But rather, it's not adding Christ to your life. It's adding your life to him so that as you are in him and he transforms you, there's observable impact. We've all known people who call themselves Christians and their lives and attitudes stink. Don't let that kind of person keep you from trusting Christ if you're unsaved. Don't let that kind of person keep you complacent and content in spiritual mediocrity if you're saved. Look to someone whose life Christ really has impacted. If you've been around a lot of genuine believers, if you've spent some time here at Thompson Road, you can definitely think of some people that there's no (laughs) earthly explanation for their attitude and their joy and their resilience that is a sign of Christ's resurrected power. Peter's message to the religious leader of the first century, and the message for us in the 21st century is this. If Jesus is dead, he has no resurrection power. So if Jesus is still producing life-changing power in people's lives, he must not be dead. If people are still being miraculously, radically, observably impacted by the power of Jesus, he must be raised. He must be alive. So if you want to know whether Jesus is dead or whether the resurrection is real, look at the changed lives of those who have truly given themselves to him. Because if someone had their life changed by Jesus, after Jesus had been executed... Well, then the resurrection story is real and resurrection power is still impactful. Friends, Jesus is alive. Those who have been converted are alive. Are you alive in Christ? And are you living in Christ? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your power that raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus, our Savior, we praise you for willingly laying down your life and taking it up again, and not just keeping it in heaven, but sending it by your condescending grace to impact the lives of all those who will embrace the truth of your message and give themselves and all they are to you. Change our lives, Lord. Help the risen Jesus to be evidenced by observable impact in our lives. If there's someone here who's struggling with that impact, wondering whether they've experienced it, wondering if their sins are blotted out and conversion is real, and they, as John eleven twenty five 25 says, when they die, yet shall they live. If someone's struggling with that, get, you're tugging at their heart right now. Give them the courage, the resolve, the peace to come to Christ today. 
And pray for believers who Easter finds them in a stretch of life that has been characterized by mundane things and sinful struggles and earthly trials and maybe a radical impact isn't showing in their life right now. Lord, would you, by your cleansing, convicting, sanctifying, resurrection power, fill us today as we submit ourselves to you. Help us to overcome sin and exemplify Christ and be evidences of his power by the way we live. We praise you for your life-giving grace. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to be a help to you if you're struggling today with the question of salvation and conversion. You don't have to wait a minute longer as the music plays and we begin this hymn. You can come right on down front and uh, someone will be watching and be able to take you to the side room, show you some Bible verses, help to uh, field your questions and, and uh, uh, just show you what Christ has shown us. Uh, find one of us after service too, we'll be available. Don't leave here without peace of knowing your life has Im been impacted by Christ's resurrection power. Number 140 in your songbooks is what we'll close in singing. And this song is uh, a testimony that uh, we as Christians should be able to sing with gladness. He lives within my heart. And, you know, as the chorus closes, it, it says, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. And to kind of go along with what Pastor Joel is saying, it was saying, is that reflected in your heart on the outside? Can other people see that he lives in your heart by how you live? And again, as Pastor Joel said, if there's something that we can do to help you with, if you're not 100% sure that you've personally been impacted and experienced Jesus Christ's resurrection power, please don't hesitate to come and talk to us even now as the instrumentalists begin to play or after the service. Would you stand with me as we sing the first and third verse of He Lives? I serve a risen Savior. Before we dismiss, I just want to thank you again for being here today. If you are a first-timer or the first time in a long time, I hope as you go out your lobby, you'll stop by the Welcome Center to your right. Just get a little Connect card that you can share whatever information you wish to and receive a small gift. If you have kids here with you, uh, get them first because there's something for them there at the Welcome Center as well. I uh, hope you'll come back next Sunday. 
April 24th marks 58 years that God has been working in and through Thompson Road Baptist Church. It'll be a special day here, Anniversary Sunday. So we remember Pastor Brad Jury, who was on our pastoral staff years ago, will be here preaching. We'll have a lunch uh, together over in the gym, bring a dish to pass. Or even if you forget, just come and join us. There'll be plenty, and we're glad to have you. I want to let you know also about just two weeks away on the 30th, at the end of the month here on Saturday, is our Community Connection Day from 11 to 2. Uh, here on our church grounds, bounce house, face paint, balloon animals, crafts, snacks, Chick-fil-A, all kinds of great stuff to, to come out for. Bring your family, invite friends, neighbors, kids, grandkids, and, and uh, come out and join us for an opportunity to serve our, our Lord, our church, our community by connecting with our neighbors in that way. I want to remember our missionary of the month this week. Please pray for the Bowens as they travel and uh, prepare to head back to Madagascar. Uh, let's sing together our chorus. It's number 672, or the words will be on the screen. As we're dismissed, He is Lord. He is